So I put this poll on Facebook um, with a situation where veteran Christina had been playing lots of races to three with alternate breaks and flip for the first break and wondering whether Federer, who has a significant break advantage, will win more sets if they switch to winter breaks, flip for the first break and winter break. And these are the results. 113 people said Federer will win more sets with winter breaks and 23 people gave the right answer. So there's a widespread misconception here. And that in and of itself is not so unusual. There's lots of things that are poorly understood at pool. What makes this one different is that it doesn't tend to go away as the player gets more sophisticated. So pro players get this wrong, stake horses and gamblers get this wrong, um, highly educated pool players get this wrong. Look at this as being like a cognitive version of an optical illusion. Some people say, of course, it's a huge advantage for Federer, and if you don't understand that, you don't understand pool, and it doesn't matter what you say. Others try to reason it out, something like this. They say, well, look, Federer wins most of the games, and if you switch to winner breaks, he's going to be breaking more, and if he has a break advantage, he's going to win more games with winner breaks. And if he wins more games with winner breaks, he's going to win more sets with winner breaks. While that sounds reasonable, the illusion is buried in that reasoning. Now, math is a language that most people don't speak, right? And that probably in includes you. Um, but gut it out. Listen for four or five minutes. Let your head hurt a little bit uh, and try, because I think by the end, you'll get this. The probability Federer wins a game is two-thirds. We call that P. If he doesn't win the game, he loses it. And that has probability one minus P, and we call that Q. I'm going to analyze a race to two because that's easier than a race to three and it has all the right features. There are three and only three ways to win a race to two. You can win the first two games, win the first, lose the second, win the third, or you can lose the first and win the next two. The probability of winning the first two games, winning by two to zero, is P times P. The probability of win-loss-win is P times Q times P. Loss win win is Q times P times P. The probability of winning the whole set is these added up. Now, remember this because we're going to put in a break advantage and see how things change. But first, let's look at these three terms and see how big they are. The first term, Federer winning by a score of 2 to 0, is the biggest. That's P times P, 2 thirds times 2 thirds, which is 4 ninths. That's 44%. The other two terms are smaller and Note that they're the same size. They're 15% and 15%. Here's what these three terms look like. The tall bar on the left is the 44 out of 100 sets that Federer wins by a score of 2 to 0. The two shorter bars are the 30 out of 100 times that Federer wins by a score of 2 to 1. You add them up and you get 74 wins out of 100 sets. The other 26 are won by Christina. You can see this 74 out of 100 in the Fargo Raid app, by the way, by putting any two players 100 points apart and getting set odds for a race to two. Okay, now we'll put in a break advantage and see how things change. We'll start where we started before, where P and Q are the probability of win and loss averaged over the breaks. And then we'll note that these probabilities change when we put in a break advantage. In particular, with winner breaks and a break advantage, Federer has a higher chance of winning a game that follows a previous win because he's breaking. So perhaps 0.7 goes to 0.8. And for a game that follows a loss, it's Christina's break and Federer's win probability goes down. There's also corresponding changes to the loss probabilities. So let's see how this changes things. We'll start where we were before, right here. The first game doesn't change because we're flipping for the first break, but all of the subsequent games have changed probabilities. Federer wins by a score of two to zero more frequently. Instead of 44%, P times P, it's now 53%. And that's because if he wins the first game, he gets to break in the second game. And if that was the whole story, it would be winner breaks, advantage fetter. But the two routes to a 2 to 1 score also change, and they're not equal anymore. Win loss win, which with alternate break happened 15 out of 100 times, now happens only 7 out of 100 times. And you can see why. Look at the second and the third game. Federer has to lose the middle game off his own break, which is less likely, 
and then he has to win the third game off of Christina's break, which is also less likely. And then loss win win happens about 14 out of 100 times. So it looks like this. With winner breaks, Fetter wins more of the sets with a 2 0 score, but fewer of the sets with a 2 to 1 score. So let's go back to the argument that we saw several times from those claiming Federer has an advantage with winner breaks. They say if Federer is more likely to win a game when he breaks, and you let him break more often, he's going to win more games. And that part is correct. It's the second part of the argument that makes it wrong, and that is the suggestion that if he wins more games, he's going to win more sets. Because the other thing winner breaks does is it shifts the set scores toward more disparate scores. So he actually has to win more games to win the same number of sets. Now, as in, is common in gambling, when the winner of a previous set keeps the break for the next set, that's a different story. As you might guess, if you go to loser breaks, better wins fewer games, but not fewer sets. Yes, this works for races to three and races to 11 and races to any length. So a break advantage is realized with winner breaks if they play a fixed number of games or they play by the games, or they keep the break from set to set. But in a tournament race with winner breaks, there's no advantage to the better breaker. 